Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining the Walk Weekly Podcast Friday Live, another Friday. And we welcome you all for joining us. You are joining Michelle Sweeney McCombs and uh, Walter Latham, and we are your hosts. You know, we are finally doing a deep dive into what happened at the massacre of Greenwood, a suburb of Tulsa, Oklahoma. Believe it or not, it was on 60 Minutes, so I mean, I hey, Poor disclosure. I mean, it's been out there for 100 years. Okay. May 31st to June 1st made 100 years since this massacre occurred at Black Wall Street, our Black Wall Street. And we also want to talk about George Floyd, the murder of George Floyd. It's not a celebration, uh, it's a remembrance of George Floyd. Many, many more have died and will continue to die. I saw some the other day, somebody else was captured on video and that came to light. So they're killing us. They're killing us continuously, nonstop. So what I want to know is, you know, what, what what's next? All right, and I'm gonna try to do it, Michelle, because, uh, you know, we want to get moving with this show and maybe somewhat abbreviated, but we'll we'll go where the show takes us. And again, yes. thank you for joining the Walt Weekly Podcast Friday Live. Michelle? Thank you, Walter. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining the Walt Weekly Friday Live. Thank you to our live audience guests for joining us. Please follow the Walt Weekly and share this podcast by clicking on the share button at the bottom. The Walt Weekly is sponsored by Beauty Blends by Ami, Soap and Love, and Michelle Sweeney here. Our intro and outro music is provided by Uncle Nephew. And we have... As always, our return panel guests, weekly guests, Greg Coleman out of North Carolina, COO of Illumination Media and Technology and Engineer at the Walt Weekly. We have Christopher Sweeney out of New Jersey, retired sanitation worker and CEO of Johnny Roof's Catering Services. Next, we have Ernest J. Robinson out of Washington, D.C., Sergeant, U.S. Marine Corps, combat veteran, senior consultant at, at B. Ernest leadership and professional consultant. Last but not least, we have Honorable Jean Anthony Edwards, male district leader, 79th district out of the Bronx, New York. I will post everyone's social media and websites in the chat room. Back to you, Walter. Thank you, Michelle. And thanks to our, the big four. That's what I call them, the big four. All right, and that's Chris, Ernest, Jean, and Greg. Oh, thank you guys. Thank you for all you do. Uh, you know, we're back on a serious note, uh, and we can't seem to lighten it up, but we, we're in a, a fight, and, and that's just the way it is. So I'm going to open up with, uh, what do y'all guys think any progress made since George Floyd one year ago? Any progress made in the area of uh, racial uh, injustice, police brutality, anything, anything uh, we realized? That was good just then? All right, who was that? Chris, we got a conviction. We did get a conviction. Yeah, well, that's the only thing. It took y'all guys a while. But, <laughs> yeah, we did get that. I mean, really, <laughs> there was a delay because nobody can think of anything. But we did think of a conviction, which was, uh, I mean, that's just, that, that should have been a given any damn way. So, well, I, well, Walter, I mean, to, to address the, the question broadly, you know, yeah. have yeah. we made progress? I mean, I, I think it's kind of hard to be able to say, you know, what absolutely is progress. Um, you know, Chris is still right. I mean, there, there was a conviction. I mean, when when over the past, you know, all the way back to Trayvon Martin. Um, we really have not seen uh, a conviction. Um, and you're talking about between uh, 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 
Mike Brown and and and, and Alton Sterling and you know and the list goes on and on. Right. We hadn't seen the conviction, so that in itself is is a small is a small win. Um, we sit there and say overall pro- progress, mm, probably not as far as we need to be. So I mean, if if we were on a a, a sliding scale or or any type of grading scale, and this was a progress report, we're probably still at a D. Um, you know, you know, we're not like failing. An F. <laughs> I mean, look, I mean, I was, I was, I was being gracious. Like I said, it's a slide yes. scale. Yeah. <laughs> 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 <It's a slide laughs> scale. Yeah. Okay. Oh, no. Well, you're, you're, Ernest, you're, you're a glass half full type of guy. You know what I mean? That's where it sounds. I'm okay. not going to be as gracious. I, I think, I think we're failing. And I think it's, you know, you, when you look, you know, we would, the prior four years, we could say it was because of the administration. And I know this, this new administration had got a lot of things going on, but I did expect to be a little further when it came to criminal justice and criminal justice issues than we are right now. That bill is still sitting. And I think the Democrats are being absolutely too passive. And look, they have the majority. They better use that advantage before they lose it. The, the 22 uh, midterms are coming soon. People are campaigning. They need to flex the muscle that was being flexed on them. And and right now, when it comes to passing this this bill, I think the Republicans are punking them. Um, there's, there's, there needs to be progress and we're not seeing it and people are still dying. So when it comes to that, we're, we're failing. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly, Greg, on a number of issues that they have pending, you know, especially the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. And I think that's the one that you're referring to. Yes. Yeah. 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 That they're negotiating instead of just pushing it through because they're, they're you know, there there's some things in there. For example, you know, the bill aims to uh, for certain police techniques to be not used anymore, such as chokeholds and cartilage corduroy holes and, uh, you know, having accountability civilly and then having a database of when police commit, you know, acts, violent acts, there should be a database of those, all right, that, that's uh, out there. And uh, that's going to, and, and Republicans are holding it up. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, they're not something that you, they're not just not used to being accountable. They don't want to be answer, the answer to anybody. So that's what this this act calls it, you know, puts into play, you know, rules and regulations of the road for them to follow, which is, you know, I, I like going by the book. Go by the book, a lot of times you're right. When you're confused, go by the book. So they want to put a book out there for them to uh, conduct themselves by. But uh, as Greg said, you know, they, they uh, the Democrats, you know, they're just slow. They want bipartisan. Sometimes you can't get bipartisan. When the Republicans were there, they pushed everything through. They didn't give a damn whether about Chuck Schumer or Nancy Pelosi or any type of Democrat. And they should do the same while they're in power. Yeah, we need gangster. We don't need bipartisan. The last administration was gangster. They gangstered everything. So that, that gangster needs to be returned. Okay. Yeah. Anybody mm-hmm. else have any comments uh, on that? I, on the George Floyd think- Justice and Policing Act? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. I think the the Democrats are trying to restore order to government, right? And in doing that, they are rooted in tradition. And I think they, I, I you know, I think they're missing what's going on here. They're missing about they. They're not hearing. They're not in tune with the people, and tradition doesn't get anything done in this country. Traditionally, they haven't done anything when it comes to black and brown people. And they they continue to operate in a tra- traditional way. And the Republicans have just thrown that out the window. They don't care. And they're going to do whatever they got to do. They're going to filibuster. They're going to gangster. They're going to they're going to just they're going to just they gonna push these laws and slow footed on this George Floyd bill with the Democrats, they're in every other in these Republican states passing bills to to counter it before it even gets passed. 
Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. the Democrats really need to, to take the pulse of what's going on and and get get on the move because the traditional way of doing things is just not it's not going to work anymore. Right. Yeah, I want to ask Gene this question. Gene, what do you think about the attempt by the Biden administration to get some type of consensus or some buy-in from Republicans? Uh, therefore, you know, slow walking a lot of these changes that they want to implement. Well, when the uh, Asians started getting attacked, you know, random attacks against the Asians, they, they they passed that bill within a week. It took them no time to get that done. You know, um, in the meantime, you know, uh, as has things gotten better since, you know, the uh, George Floyd situation a year ago? I mean, we just saw that brother down in Louisiana get beat to death by those state troopers. I mean, that was George Floyd 2.0. And then you can hear, you know, the uh, audio from some of the state troopers. They were like bragging about having blood on their uniform from the guy and things of that nature. So, um, no, I don't I think I think we're still being, you know, sold a, you know, bag of bad goods, you know, and and it's funny when, um, you know, Trump was in office, we talked about the racism and, you know, people in his administration putting up the white power sign and things of that nature. And as soon as Trump gets out of office, then you hear Democrats say there's no racism in America. What? So what? Trump was the face of racism. And now that he's gone, racism is gone. I mean, come on. It's it's a total con job. It's a total con job. And, yep. you know, at, 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 at some point, black folks, got, black folks, including myself, we got to stop blindly voting Democrat and start looking at other options, you know, whether it's sitting it out or, you know, starting our own independent, independent party. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now you're what? speaking my language, Gene. Yeah, but you guys are being lied to. But. Mm-hmm. The thing is, yeah, I, I mean, you're going to just open the door for Republicans to go and go to come right back in. They're going to fill that vacuum. OK. And what's the I mean, difference? You know, it's, well, what's the difference? George Floyd was killed during a Republican led administration. And right. that brother, I can't think of his name in Louisiana. He was killed during the Democratic led. Yeah, Ronald, Ronald Green. Green. No, well, yeah. well, Ronald yeah. Green was, no, killed was two, two years, years ago. No, that was two years ago. It was two years right. ago. They just covered it oh, up. Oh, oh, oh the two videos years ago, coming they just, out now. Yeah, 2019, yeah. yeah. But but given you say that, there was a brother that was just killed similar to the way Ronald Green was killed in, in Tacoma, North Carolina. Washington. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, you, you get the, you know, what happened in, in Elizabeth City. But uh, last week, there was a, a young black guy um, killed in Tacoma, Washington by the police who, again, they made, you know, They charged the police in that case. I yeah, think yeah, they charged them. They no, okay, yeah, they're definitely charging them, but I'm saying it's still happening. You know, they're still oh, absolutely you know, listen right in there, you listen, know, doing when, their own thing. When Repu- when Democrats can get on TV and say there's no racism in 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 this country, that they're, they're they're full of crap, and that and they don't want to deal with the elephant in the room. Absolutely, like like Gene said, they dealt with the Asian uh, 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 bill, which they should have, right? Yep. Yep. But there was no pushback on the Asians. Like, there's no other people matter too when they stop Asian hate, right? Or, you know, like they do with Black Lives Matter or All Lives Matter. But there was no counter for the Asian stuff, mm-hmm. which it shouldn't be. And I don't want to sound like, you know, I'm not, you know, happy that they got something. But hey, we've been online here. What what's going on? Give me a break. And some Asians are not kind to our community either. So, you know what I mean? I'm not ready to jump on board for them either and, and sing and dance when, they, when they're when beating sisters in, in hair stores and, and dragging them out because they think they're stealing and stuff like that. That's so right. we got an issue in this country. And no matter what, we seem to be last on the, on the list to get what to get what we deserve and what's right for us. Here's the thing. That's a problem. Here's, here's the right thing about that whole Here's the thing um, about that whole uh, Asian hate thing and how the bill was passed so fast and what, you know, got me to thinking. Out of all the minority groups, Asians have to be at the bottom of the totem pole. 
what's the major party that they, you know, um, are wedded to? Is it Democrats, Republicans? I don't know. You know, I know there are a few, you know, Democratic, you know, Asians here in New York City, but New York City is mostly a, 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 a blue state. But it's not, it's, not, it's not as many Asians in the United States as there are black people. And I'm wondering, like, damn, why did, you know, the government come to their rescue so fast? Just like, you know, um, some of the protests in Times Square between, you know, the uh, Palestinians and the Israeli. As soon as the, uh, the uh, Jewish guy got beat up, well, he got jumped by Palestinians, you know, uh, anti-protesters. They were all arrested and charged with a hate crime. So I'm thinking, like, well, damn, something happened to the Jews. You know, the government acts on it right away. Something happens to the Asians. Right. The government acts on it right away. Something happens to black people. There, there's, there's, there's almost yeah. no movement. And you, you know what it is? The uh, Asians in America, they have a father. The Jews in America, they have a father. You see, if something happens to an Asian in New York City, the mayor, the governor, the president, they're going to get a phone call from the prime minister of China because one of ours got hurt on your soil. If something happens to a Jewish person in New York City, they're going to get a phone call from prime minister Netanyahu because one of mine got hurt on your soil and you better do something about it. When a black person gets hurt in America, we don't have a father that can pick up the phone and call the president and say, you better do something because one of mine's got hurt. And, you know, that 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 oil deal we had in Nigeria, it's going to be all oh, take care of my people that's living on your soil. We don't have a father. We don't have a father. I agree with that, Gene. Yeah, and I, I also pretty think, much Gene, like a single I also parent. think... We, we, have, we have a mother. I also think... Mm -hmm. No, I was going to say, I think that if they admit anything when it comes to us, they know they got to pay a big price. They owe us a lot and they don't want to pay it. They don't want to pay that toll. They don't want to pay that bill. So they will they will try to find ways around dancing to admitting that there is. You know injustice in this country for black people. I think admitting that opens the door for them to open for everybody to say, hey, this has been going on a long time. How do we compensate these people? And they don't want to compensate us. Well, I mean, when you mention compensation, I mean, they don't want to go down that, that rabbit hole. To them, it's a rabbit hole because there's no way they can compensate us for over 400 years of oppression. There's no, I mean, they can, but we're talking a hundred trillion dollars minimum. And I'm talking hard, concrete, something you can put your hand on type assets. All right. They don't want to go down that rabbit hole. Okay. Because what, what, I mean, you can look at the Biden reconstruction, one point, whatever trillion, they owe us trillions of dollars. And I'm only talking compensation. I'm not talking punitive damage. If you take, and we've worked us for over 400 years for nothing as slaves, and if they had to pay us the wages for that 400 year period, how much do you think it's going to add up to? Okay? Good point. Mm -hmm. And then if you tack on punitive, what do you think it's going to add up to? It's, they cannot pay it. I mean, we will own the whole country. I've said this in earlier episodes, all right, that. Now we talk, we're going down the road of, of reparations because that's where they think it's going to go. And they don't want to go there. You know, there was a guy in Oklahoma, governor, I can't recall his name now, that said that, you know, and I'm jumping ahead, but he doesn't want his son feeling bad about, you know, the, the, the acts, the atrocities that were committed by their ancestors because it would make the, the little boy feel bad. Hmm. Now, can you imagine... Can you imagine mm -hmm. that? <laughs> right? I mean, and, and, and they feel like victims now. I mean, that, that's what they're saying. That you're victimizing me. I can't help that my ancestors did this. I can't help that. Okay, mm -hmm. well, if you can't go back, if you, you can't help that, then do something f from this point forward. Okay? Take an action now and say, okay, I'm going to turn this around and going forward, this is going to be... No, they, they don't want to do that either. They'd rather mm -hmm. have... The status quo. 
No, so but the, I I think that a lot of points have been made from what Gina said, what Chris has said, Greg, and what you just said, Walter. But a lot of times, as a people, we become complacent. That father figure that Gene had, had referenced, Worth Kicks to Me, came in the form of a Marcus Garvey. It came in the form of a of a Malcolm X. It came in the form of a of a Dr. King. It came in the form of the Black Panther Party. For somebody who would recognize that a wrong was done and would make had the influence to pick up the phone and to make a call to sit there and say, this needs to be corrected. Um, and we had those type of influential individuals who would take up for our community and they killed them. And then there's been a hesitation from stepping out beyond the intelligible conversations that we may have, whether now today and on a podcast or in the, in the comforts of, of a barbershop or a salon. Um, but they have gone no further than that. We haven't passed, you know, again, I've mentioned this before on, on previous shows, but we haven't passed meaningful legislation since the Fair Housing Act of 1968. And those are things that we have that are within our control that we can control. We, 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 we could influence some things more if we would just identify how we want to do and prioritize ourselves to being able to achieve those things. We have to be able to chew. Uh, okay. and, and walk at the same time. Two gum and walk at the same time. Anybody else? I think there has to be. I mean, I, I think, you know, the powers that be only respect that economic influence. And we uh, we've been talking about this for decades. There has to be some type of economic unification something that we can flex as a people. We want respect as a, as a group, as a unified group, then we have, to, we have to flex some type of economic muscle. And that can't be you know, dollars and cents that, that we're just taking for granted. When you know, they don't respect our dollars, they don't respect us as people. I think one of the things, you know, they respect the, the Jewish economic impact. They respect you know, Asians economic might. And, and they, they, they've shown over the centuries that they don't respect ours. And I, unfortunately, I don't think we make them respect it. You know, we're here, there and everywhere. There's no unification and we have to unify on, on something. And I know that sounds, you know, pie in the sky ish, but you know, something's got to give here. We, we got to fight back some kind of way. Yeah, okay. but you know, here's the problem. Was that Chris? Was that Chris or Greg? It was Greg. Greg. Yep. Okay. Here's the, here's the problem with that, Greg. There's no sustainability mm. anymore with us. I mean, like the uh, Montgomery bus boycott was successful because of all the reasons given by you. But you know what? There, there's no there's no sustainability amongst us. No. There's no. I uh, no, you're, you're, Look, I, I agree we, with you 100, percent Gene. But how do we, we change we, uh, that? Well, you got to change the whole nigga mentality, which I don't know if that's even okay. possible because we okay. boycotted Gucci for what, a month? And now these niggas is back wearing Gucci slippers all over again. Yeah, but, but that's what I'm but, talking but, about. But, that's Gene, where the battle is. But hold on a second. Hold on. It wasn't just the mentality that stopped the Mon Montgomery bus uh, strike. They realized the Montgomery bus strike was breaking them. So they mm -hmm. included us. Mm -hmm. And that's what helped stop it. They infiltrated the community. And they allowed you to ride their buses. And we thought that was a victory. Yay, we could ride their buses. When we didn't realize, we started our own, in our own industry. We had our own people riding on our own buses. We didn't need them. But again, it's their ISIS colder theory. They, as that long as whenever you make strides in doing something, that is going to affect them financially, they're going to come in and say, hey, we got to give them something. And we got to make them think we're on their side. And that's what they did with that bus strike. It wasn't that just was that the, the power people need, didn't the power sustain it. Needed. Yes, they, they came in and said, let them on the bus. And the bus company was still fighting against them and they wound up going out of business. But the rest of them 
didn't fall prey to that. They said, let them on the bus because we need their money. And once they let us on the bus, we didn't think we needed to ride the other buses anymore. That was part of the problem. And that was a, that was a major black company. That was a major bus company. Yeah. They went out of business because we plucked over yep. to, to ride in the regular trailways in Greyhound or whatever. Exactly. Yeah, we can. They they, they color it. They 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 make it a nice picture for you to. Oh, it's a beautiful setting for you. They set it all up nice and lovely for you to come back, and they throw you something. And as soon as you turn your back on the on the on the black company, then they go back to their old tricks again. Yep, because you have no fallback. You burnt that bridge. Okay, guys. So that's the right, solution, though, that we need to find. We need to, what's, you know, what's going to break that? What's going to change that? And it can't be, you know, we can't have a, a hopeless outlook on it. Oh, it's never going to happen. It, it's it's got to happen. Or we can expect the same results. Well, I mean, I don't think that the young the younger generation is going to uh, stand for uh, no movement, no change. I think that they've been exposed just in time that they're going to carry it forward. I really do. I mean, people, I mean, when I say people, people I'm talking about the older people, generation, I'm, you know, they got to raise families. They got to make sure their kids get an education. I know. And, and, and they can't speak the way they want to speak. They can't afford to protest every day and all this kind of stuff because they're preparing the next generation. Walter, that, but that's the walking and chewing gum part that I was saying at the same time that I was talking about. We have to be able to do one and the other. It's not either or, it's both and. We have to be able to, like, for for example, one of the things I think that have stifled some generations is the hesitation in between from the years of 1960-ish through the, you know, up up until the 90s. You know, so for everyone that was born 68, 69, 70, whatever it can be, maybe some of them wasn't as uh, educated or exposed. A lot of people started withdrawing from, again, started withdrawing from HBCU, started withdrawing from the Black Panther Party, started withdrawing from things that will rile up the the the, the other man or white man or however anybody wants to you know categorize it, and, mm-hmm. and started becoming mm-hmm. more docile. Started making sure that hey, you know, let's go to these schools. Let's learn. No, no, that you know, slavery wasn't that bad. We, we, there's, there's our people, our family members that will sit there and say slavery wasn't that bad. Oh, Jim Crow, you know, them, them, mm. them uppity Negroes were, you know, were, were, were pushing things and didn't know how good they had it. And mm. and so we have to be able to. So the mm. way to be able to get back to that is that one, we have to be able to call things out the way that they are. No, we're not where we need to be. And here's how we need to get there. We need to, we need to, I mean, it, we have to be just as intentional as any other ethnicity that we see. We have to be just as intentional as Asians are when it comes down to learning economics, when it comes down to learning politics, when it comes down to learning, you know, being in touch with whatever spirituality that you, that you would choose to, to associate yourself with, but be in tune with that. And not and not down somebody else because they choose to believe in something else. As long as those as whatever their beliefs are 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 going to uplift your community, then then support that. But we have to be able to do both and not either or. And also, I just want to make a you. point. I want to make a point that you know, speaking about the bus boycott, right? Uh, during that time where we had our own buses, right? Even though the government, they, they changed their laws so we were able to ride on the buses. Why do we have to stop riding on our own buses? Why is it that every time something happens, they give us an inch, we jump for it, and we forget about what we started for our own selves? Why can't we just keep our patterns with keeping our own instead of trusting the clear people again when they give you a, a in, an inch? It goes back to, I mean, like again, like when we had... Like Black Wall Street, you know, in, in Tulsa um, was was replicated. Um, you had Greenwood, you had Rosewood, you had D.C., you had Baltimore, um, Richmond, you know, all these areas that we didn't rebuild. We just accepted the the hundred thousand dollars for the property or the land or whatever and was displaced and, and, and never moved back. And we, we, we always go for the now. 
Really? Well, I was just saying that it was tough for us to make any headway, even after they admit something and they give you something back. They do something else to trip you up. Here. True. It's never it's it's never anything done for us without a backhand. And I think for me, in my opinion, I think this hip hop generation is really going to be the generation, the people coming from that genre with with the money that they're investing and the money that they're making and they're into tech and they're into Bitcoin and they're into investments big and they're buying industry. They're, they're looking to buy teams. They're looking to, to get into all kinds of things. And that's when you start to see change because young people actually see themselves in those positions. It's not until you start to see yourself all over the place that you understand that you can make a change and you can be that person. For so long, we haven't seen anybody be able to make it to the top without any issues or without being attached to anything else. That's I did want to say, I did want to say to Ernest, and I just want to circle back to what Ernest said that, about walking and uh, chewing gum at the same time. You know, walking and chewing gum at the same time could be a strategy or a tactic, you know, uh, as part of a long-term strategy. Okay. And I indicated that, you know, the people that are raising their kids and preparing them to be men and women, that's what they do. In the meantime, you prepare, once those kids are prepared and ready to, to go out into society and make changes, they, they, they are intentionally out there armed, whether it be in, intellectually, whether it be in the hip hop game, musically, talent, whatever, they're prepared to go out there and make a substantial change. Until such time, you know, we have to continue down the path that we are right now in terms of raising, making sure that our kids have an education, making sure that our kids have a skill, making sure that they have what's necessary for the future. Yeah, but that's here's, but here's the thing. No, no, I, and I, I agree with that part. And and then that's and that may be whether you call that the chewing gum part or the walking part, whichever one. The other part is, is while still raising those kids, they still need for those parents to be the activists that they wish those kids to be. They need to show that they need to pull out that blueprint, you know, to to be able to, you know, exemplify, model the expected behavior that you want to see in your kids. Yes, you want to educate them, make sure that they're articulate, make sure that they have critical thinking, all those things. But now, okay, well, what am I supposed to do with all of this? The, these these wonderful words that I I know how to use the and and write I can say them I can speak them and I can write them but then how how do I use them for to to move agendas across I I didn't I didn't get that part and so that's the part where I'm saying we have to do it you know pl- you know both and you know and 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 so that's what it is and it may be tough and difficult because you did indicate that yes. A lot of people are in very vulnerable situations because if they say certain things, they may lose their job or and then that in that compromise, the ability to actually being able to train those up and coming, you know, children in that up and coming generation. So I, I acknowledge that and, and I see that. But that's the part where our community has to be stronger in, in, in other ways where, again, we, we have a church. If, if it's a church that is strong enough to being able to to have a benevolence fund, that's more than just, you know, a, a couple thousand dollars. I, I, I can uh, brother, we can pay your whole rent for or your mortgage for the next year because you lost your job because you were speaking out for the cause. You know, sister, we'll take care of you and your kids, wife, kids and me because this is what we can do. But not just the church. All the black fraternities and 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 Masonic lodges and and orders of Eastern stars and everything else uh, that we that we have the resources within our, within our community to being able to be sustainable, and that's where true power is. Like we uh, again, that one point three trillion dollars. When I said that, and said that last week. I mean, we just as as a black people, we we are fifteenth on the list of a GDP. 
for, I mean, well, I mean, well, if it was in comparison to a GDP, as far as spending power goes, mm -hmm. so we have the resources, we have to discipline ourselves to be and be intentional about it. We have to be willing to sacrifice. Part of the reason why that bus boycott wouldn't be able to last today, that was over a year, not just riding the black buses, but you're talking about walking, you're talking about sharing rides between, hey, hey, Barbara, hey, hey, John, you know what I'm saying? Let me take you and the kids, I'm gonna drop you off at work, I'm gonna drop them off at school. We, we don't we don't take that type of responsibility within our communities that way. And that's the part we have to be able to get back to. Uh, even though I, you know, I think that's some, somewhat cavalier. Uh, I will. I mean, I accept that. I think we, 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 we're both. It's a matter of semantics. That's what I'm saying. It's a matter of semantics. Understood. Gotcha. I think the most important thing that we can do is make sure that our kids are prepared to take on the world. In the future, okay, I I believe that that, that is what I and I've raised you know, kids. You know, I got kids. All right, I raised them. They're grown. Okay, I'm working on my grandkids now. Okay, so I take great pride in making sure that they were prepared for the world. Okay, and I think that's the first thing. Everything starts from home. Okay, everything starts from home. The examples, like you said, you set the right example. You, you know, you don't want your kids to do something. You don't do it. You don't want your kids to do drugs. Don't do it. You don't want your kids to be tardy and late for work. Don't be late for work. Live your life as an example to your kids and make sure that they're prepared. All right? So that's what I'm saying. So I think we're talking the same thing. Yeah, I'm here. <clears throat> I'm here. I'm just enjoying the right. uh, back and forth. You enjoying the back, the back and forth, the old generation and the young generation? Yeah. Uh, I yeah. wanted the Navy and the Army well, there, I mean, and the yeah, Marines I don't, to fight. Yeah. You know, well, yeah, you know what? I try not to give these you know, young people, uh, I try not to give young people a hard time because, you know, uh, I always said that, you know, my generation, you know, that 90s hip hop, we had to take responsibility for what we've produced, you know. Um, in the Bible, it says you could tell a tree by the fruit that it bears. Well, in the 90s, we promoted being drug dealers and driving Lexuses and having, you know, Rolex watches and stuff like that. Well, yeah, we sold drugs to people and they got hooked on it and they had babies. And now these rappers are the descendants of the people that we sold drugs to and that we promoted drugs to back in the 90s. And what do they talk about? Getting high. Popping mollies and Percocets and you know, unprotected sex and you know living you know recklessly, you know and, and and then you got some of these guys wearing dresses because you know we had rappers back in the '90s talking about going to jail and how they were shot callers in jail. Uh, yeah, well everybody in jail ain't a shot caller. A lot of guys are bottom boys if you understand what I'm saying. So you know and they came out of prison. They got released out of prison. Into the, into our communities, and yeah, now homosexuality is promoted. So we got to take responsibility, you know, as far as like the, the uh, middle aged people, you know, everybody that was in their twenties back in the nineties. We got to take responsibility for the for for the tree that we were and the fruit that we now bear, and that's how I feel about that. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, Ernest. For that viewpoint, uh, I do want to move over to uh, the George Floyd, George Floyd uh, uh, justice law. I mean, if it is passed, do you think it'll be effective? Yeah, I'll jump in. Um, if it's passed, I still think we're going to have you know the the same problems because this um, police mentality, these these police unions that override any any governmental legislation, they're still going to exist. It, it has to be broken down to the, to the very beginning. You have to eliminate the culture. You have to root out the bad and, and retrain from the very beginning. But part of that retraining means you have to change how they pick candidates for the police department. You, you, can't, you can't do it the way we've been doing it. You know, the guy that got 
the guy that got bullied in high school and wants to show everybody how tough he is and, and you know, that he's made it, you can't let him on your police force. But that's what a lot of these mm-hmm. police, who a lot of these police forces want on their police force. They want that guy with the chip on his shoulder that's going to go in there like he's got something to prove. And, and now that mm-hmm. he's got his gang of, of buddies in blue, he's fearless. We got to, we have, mm-hmm. you have to have number one, you have to have people that grew up in that area, that, that understand the area, policing their own areas. People that have some, right. some skin in the game have to, to be the one. Not afraid that, of that people. But, mm-hmm. you know, patrol their own areas. So even if the legislation is passed, there's going to be loopholes that their masters are getting around loopholes that, you know, look, look, look at it. Look at it like this. The, the week that the verdict was passed down in Minneapolis, another young black man was killed in Minneapolis. Right. So, you know, the same day, and, actually. And they knew mm-hmm. it was wrong. Right. You know, they, they, they were feeling the heat from what police brutality did, and they did it anyway, because it's, it's systemic, it's, it's ingrained, it's in them. And legislation is good, but it's not gonna stop it. We need well, to, you, you, gotta, you gotta change the way this is done. You gotta get rid of those that are, what, what did they used to call them during slave days? They were slave patrols. You gotta get rid of that slave patrol mentality. Well, I mean, and I think that, everybody can hear me now, right? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, I, I, you know, what, what Greg is saying is is is, is spot on. Um, but you know, even though that we're, we're not talking about voting, but this is the reason why voting is so important, because on every single level, again, from the police chief to the sheriff, if you happen to live in the county, to the DA, to the to some judges, you know, appellate judges. I mean, some of them are on federal levels are are appointed, but then that's the reason why it's so important to make sure that, that whoever does the appointments or the recommendations, like you do, who, how many people even know like how you even get nominated to become a judge, even though you don't vote on it. You know, what's the nomination process? Who are the ones who actually, you know, signed letters and wrote letters to the governing body to sit there and say that this person is be good for this, right? Who vouched for them? I mean, Gene, Gene actually talks a lot about people that he supports. Like He vouches for said person because they do this, 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 and this, and this. Well, who's vouching for some of these people? So that's the way. So to back to the question, in order for it to work, Greg is right. We're going to have to we have to clean up a lot of stuff. We have to be, we have to promote from within ourselves. One, to be elected officials, to come and represent our own communities, two, to become police officers within those communities. But it does take, you know, you know, you know, how, how do we join the unions? How do we support the unions? You know, supporting, uh, you know, uh, you know, pay advances and things of that nature. Like we have to be mindful of how we talk about defunding. Where was defunding the police, right? You know, but we have to be mindful that we're not talking about getting rid of the police. We're talking about reallocating those funds. So, you know, even when we talk, so when we say defund the police, I mean, it becomes a it's a it's a buzzword and not the true intention of, of, of what is designed for when saying defund the police. It's a reallocation of funds to being able to do exactly what Greg has said, to be able to have more community support when we're talking about police in our, our, our areas, but that goes to an education and an exposure opportunities that we sometimes we miss out on being able to add clarity to what it is that we mean. So we need to define what we mean, promote from within, and then that legislation, once it passes, will do just fine because we'll be more intentional about who we hire, how we hire, and how we hold them accountable. I uh, want to pivot now to Tulsa, the Tulsa Massacre, 1921. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I was so shocked to see on 60 Minutes on Sunday that they had a segment on the massacre in Tulsa, well, Greenwood, which is a uh, part of Tulsa, right. a section of Tulsa, and how they were looking for these mass graves and things where, you know, groups of people were buried. And and they, it, it was... It, it, it was such a thing. And they buried it in history. I mean, you couldn't even find it in the history books up until the, the, in recent times. Okay. A matter of fact, I didn't hear about it until I was looking at Watchmen on HBO. 
I'm not to plug HBO, not to plug Watchmen, but that's what, you know, one of the primary characters was from Greenwood. Okay. And then I looked up the Tulsa Massacre and I said, damn, why come I'd never heard of this? I've been in the world a long time. Why have I not heard of this? Or how did I miss this? That's why I wanted to include it in the show because maybe some of y'all guys may have missed it. So I want you to know that back in 1921, May 31 through June 1st, all right, there was a massacre of 300 people. They say 100, but 300 black people. He originally said 36, but the commission said 150 to 300 was confirmed. Yes, and and they're still discovering these mass graves, and they're looking for them now. It's become, you know, right. something that uh, right. they can probably you know, reap some money from. They they make a big discovery or whatever, you know. So, but that that's not it. But but the thing is, I want people to know that this is something that was done to us, to the most prominent black people in the country. They had their own stores. They were doctors. They were lawyers. They were prominent people. The black wall. Because back then there was a gold or was it oil. I think oil prompted the riches that, that came through to through, uh, uh, Greenwood. But you had a lot of problems. They, they were independent, financially independent. So a, 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 right. a, a child, a teenager, gets on the elevator, uh, had a white operator, girl, white operator. And between whatever floor, whatever floor they, that the little boy got off, she screamed and yelled. And all of a sudden, it's rape. They, he raped the white. They took him down to to jail. Then a group of white men wanted to try to lynch the little boy, all right, believing that he had attacked the girl, all right. And then you had people from a few guys from well, I wouldn't say a few, but some men from from Greenwood came to try to protect the boy and keep him from being lynched, all right. Then there were shots fired because some more came that were armed. Okay. And shots were fired. And then the black guys retreated back to Greenwood. That's when a whole wave of white people with guns came. And they also bombed from the air. They dropped gasoline bombs on the town. They completely wiped Greenwood off the map. They killed women children, men, anybody that they saw. They also drug one man down the street behind a car. His head popped off. And you talk about Al-Qaeda mm. and ISIS cutting off a, a white man's head? Mm. And they talk about that's so barbaric. That's what happened. And then they buried it. Well, you couldn't see it in your history books. They buried it. Now it's coming to light. They always say the dark rises to the light, whatever the term they use. That's what's happening. That's true. And so, that wasn't the only massacre. You know, that's what I want to pivot to now. And I want to. Mm-hmm. I want the panel to talk to me about that because I'm getting very upset, and I don't yeah. like getting upset. Yeah. yeah well, I hate okay. to. I hate to make you, you know, to get you a little more upset, but I think um, I want to bring out. You, you spoke about how. Um, the series of Watchmen kind of put it into the forefront for people that really didn't know about it. But this week, there are three documentaries airing this week that do a great job of, of you know, detailing exactly what went on during those uh, Tulsa, you know, uh, massacre, during the Tulsa massacre. Um, PBS, the History Channel, and the National Geographic Channel um, are all going to have documentaries about the Tulsa mass- massacre. One of those is is produced or financed at least by Russell Westbrook, who used to play for you know the Oklahoma uh, NBA team, and uh, now he's playing for Washington. But you, you got to you know hats off to him for you know putting his money behind um, the uh, PBS special. So I, I think you know I don't know where it is. You know I think everybody should uh, take a look at it um, and see where. Mm-hmm. It's going to be on, you know, in their market and definitely, definitely do yourself a favor and and take a look at these documentaries to give you a little more insight. Because 100 years later, what's stopping it from happening now? 
And right. that's the way you exactly. got to look at it. What would be stopping exactly. from happening now? So, uh, and I and you know something add, also, I want to add real quick that that was not the only ma black massacre in the United States. The Northeast right, has had the oldest one that they've had on uh, record that they do not speak about is New York in yes. 1863. Yep. That was the draft massacre, you know, when they were drafting for the Civil War. They had that massacre. That was the oldest. That's on record. So you had multiple ones throughout the Northeast, Chicago, Springfield, Detroit, Washington, Memphis, etc. I can go on. We know about Rosewood as well in 1923. So those, are, you know, the, the Tulsa one was traumatic, but the, 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 the worst one was the one in 1863 for the Civil War draft. So they need to speak on everything that has happened in the past, not just Tulsa. They're focusing on Tulsa. Why? I don't know. But that wasn't the worst one. The worst one was in 1863. There's so much history with the United States for our people that they will not acknowledge or let you know in the history books at all. So if you're not one that is uh, into your black history, you're not going to find these things. I, I was, I knew about a lot of black history, but I learned more when I had my son in a private black school when he was younger, element in a, a preschool. It was a, it was an all black school and his projects. I had to learn. I learned over with him about black history. And that was the first time I heard about the uh, Tulsa incident, and that was 20, 22 years ago. So we have to, hey. you know, teach hey. our children our history. I also yeah. want to add that hey, LeBron uh, Michelle. James hey, 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 Michelle. his crew. Hold on, hold on, Michelle. Yes. I'm sorry. Yes. Michelle, I just want to uh, piggyback on what you were talking about because I'm well read on the uh, draft mm -hmm. riots of 1863. It actually took place here in uh, New York and yes. um, uh, in several other states. What it was was that the Irish immigrants that came over, mm -hmm. um, if they were poor, they had to enlist into the Union Army and fight in the Civil War. Right now, what that was was you know a lot of Irish were dying in battle, and they felt like we came to this country for a better life. We didn't come over here to fight for these niggas. And that's that's when it jumped mm -hmm. off. That that's the whole basis behind the draft riots. The Irish immigrants right. did not want to enlist um, involuntarily into the right. Union Army right. to fight in the Civil War. That's what all that was about. Exactly. Um, go ahead, Chris. Sorry. No, I was just going to add that LeBron James and his crew are producing uh, a documentary on CNN. I think that's coming on this weekend. Uh, Russell Simmons is in, has a, a documentary about Tulsa coming out. So there are a few people that are addressing this, and it's coming out in, in the next few months. And they're revisiting Rosewood. They got a couple of other right. ones that they, they're doing something on. They're also doing a project on the African Americans who whose land was taken from them in Manhattan. Right, mm -hmm. right, that, which is Central Park. as mm -hmm. well. Yep, mm -hmm. Central yes. Park. So they got some projects coming out in the, in the near future on these things. That's great. I wanted to um, information. I Do you guys think that, that? Yeah, go ahead, Ernest. Go ahead. I wanted to add that um, part of the you know calling it the Tulsa massacre was something that was something that's new because it's always been called the Tulsa riot, mm -hmm. which is the reason why that I mean it's and the, the significance right. behind it is that. Calling it a riot absolves the, the insurance companies the responsibility of paying out the damages that were caused because it was a riot versus a, um, a massacre where there, there's a wrong that was done, either allowed or you know something that was done to somebody. And exactly. when it's a riot, it's conflict, chaos, and confusion. So therefore, it absolves them of the responsibility. So they always address things when it came down to our communities that were being destroyed as uh, riots versus massacres. Hmm. Ernest, so you are 1,000% right, because when I was a little boy, um, my parents loved music and always played R&B. 
going back to before it was called R and B, it was called soul music. Remember that, Walter? Yes. When it was oh, called yeah. soul music. Yeah. All right. And they used to play this one song that I love really good. I loved it so much. Outstanding, girl, you mm -hmm. knock me out. So yes. I asked my parents. I said, not to say that my parents are better than anybody else's, but it's important for us to educate ourselves and to pass it down to our children. I asked my mother and my father, I said, who made that song? They said, the Gap Band. I said, the Gap Band? Gap and what? Gap in their teeth? <laughs> like, you know. Uh, I remember the Gap Band. <laughs> right. And then my father said, no, Gap stands for Greenwood and Peach Street. That was the main intersection mm -hmm. in, in Greenwood. Right. For Black Wall Street. I'm like, Black Wall Street? And then they handed me a book. So I knew about go. I knew about the uh, Tulsa massacre since I was a little boy. But I did, you know, not. and I, I, and, I, I, and 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 to, and and to think that it was in front of our face the whole time. Charlie right. Wilson and them, the Gap Band. Nobody ever yes. even bothered to inquire. What? Why do you call yourselves the Gap Band? The answer would have been right there. They would have told you Greenwood and Peachtree. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Okay. That is amazing. That I mean, that's that's that's. Astounding. I mean, really, I, I, I have no words, but I do remember the gap band. Mm -hmm. All right. Now you know what the gap stands for. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I never asked in the past. Ain't that store where they sell white people clothes either? <laughs> You're down on Delancey Street? Okay. Uh, anyway, guys, uh, I mean, well, what is it? Now, this is a broad base you know, somewhat holistic in, in terms of how I'm going to ask this question is, you know, what should we do? I mean, we, we discuss this all the time. We, we talk about it and, and we, 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 we went, we went, we, we dwelled on it in this show, but what should we do as black folks, man? Do you think that we should all go back to Africa? I know Ghana is giving away, you know, you, you know, you, not citizenship, but you can go there as a resident. If you have some type of plan on how you, you plan, how you want to make it. But do you think we should all just go back to Africa or, or we should try to work with what we got and make it better here in this country? How can you go what back you guys to think? a how can you go back to a country that is not yours? I, my family, my history is here. <laughs> how do you go yeah. back to Africa where you weren't right, you weren't right, born on. there? You know, you're talking centuries of, of family. I mean, you're talking the the, the 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 beginning of slavery was in what 1600s like yeah. I, mean, oh, I, I don't think it was like, uh, yeah 1692 okay. or something like that so right so i have a lot of generations here why would i want to go back to africa when i have no clue my heritage is not there yeah, it's not going back to Africa. It's going to Africa because just like you Michelle, right? it. We, uh -huh. you're right. That's what I'm saying. There's there's, <laughs> there's nothing. I mean, Gene had pointed this out earlier. Like, there's there's no father. There's no connection to 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 Africa. Africa is a continent, not a country. So, going back to right. what country, and then within those countries, what tribe, and within that tribe, you know, so. What village that are right. you going to right. that you have absolutely no context of the language, the culture or nothing? The thing about it is about the United States, you know, and, he, and even for us to suggest going back. And I, I do understand the reason why you did it. So I'm not not carping on you, Walter, for the question. It's a great question. Um, but for even to, for the suggestion, it's philosophical in nature. You know, the fact that, yes, we are, you know, we you're Africans. But it, even when Malcolm X had described it or, or, or even before him describing, you know, African-Americans or Negroes in, in this country, there was no one country to being able to describe it. So you're describing a continent. So we have nothing to go back to. This is, by all intents and purposes, our country. And I think to Chris's point and to Greg's point that they owe a lot more and and we need to we need to seek that. And when Dr. King has sit there and said, I, you know, run me my coins, run this check. I'm here for the check. Let's collect our money. That's when he became radical. That's when and, and, and they had and they had to put him down. But those are things that we have to do. So, Don, there's nothing to go back to. 
you know, you want to visit or go to Africa and you want to switch, switch citizenship, then then by all means, I understand it and I can support anybody who wants to do that. But there's nothing to go back to because we have no connection. We've been severed. And who's to say as an American, you'll be respected there and accepted there. So yeah, but right. we go. Yeah. And you're going, you know what? You're going oh, I'm to a I've place been that's, I've been been that's broken down already. They're fractured too. They got they right. they're all in Africa. Yeah, they've been wreaking havoc. Themselves. So what? what all right. Yeah, I'm getting what some background going, noise, guys. I mean, if you're not talking, go on mute, please. But what we run into Africa for, and they're colonized. They're a mess over there. Yeah. So what we're going to run into another mess, a burning fire. I'm an American. I, I'm, I identify with my African roots, but I'm an American. I'm not going anywhere. I want what's mine here. There you go. That's what I want to do. That's why I asked people, that question. Yeah, like, like I said, everybody's got their roots in Africa if you want to be historical about it. So, you know, that to me, that's a and, and I like like Ernest said, I understand if, if you choose to want to go back to Africa to make it. Yes, you got that option. We got to. You know, we can do that if that's what we wanted to do. But that's not to me. You know, that's not an option. That wouldn't be an option for me. I think we need to stand and, and fight and demand what what we want and, and, and take what we want in this country. Not not uh, not in Africa. Oh, Love you singing, you're singing my tune. Y'all got to sing in my hey, tune. Yo. That's why I threw that question out there to see. Because if anybody would ask me, hey, yo, where are um, you from? I am from North Carolina. That's me. I'm from North Carolina. Yeah. yeah. And you know what? As, as far as people that have, you know, uh, moved to Africa, uh, whether, they, whether they're there on business or they decided to take up citizenship, I've been hearing good and bad things. So it's, it's really hard to tell because if, if I ask two people, you know, how do they feel one might say they don't like it, and the other one would say that they love it. So it's, it's pretty much a toss-up as far as moving back to Africa. And as far as what you were talking about, Chris, yeah, some, some African nations sold their soul to China, and then might, you might as well be living in China instead of living in Africa because you'll be a second-class citizen in your own motherland. But um, to address something that Michelle said about uh, uh, chattel slavery in the 1600s, no, it actually started in 1492. And that's why Christopher Columbus is so celebrated in America. He was right, the first. Right, right. Um, he was the first, and he went down to the Caribbean. Thought he found the the, the New World, and he mm -hmm. brought them back to Spain. And what happened was they had other uh, voyages that went out to uh, you know uh, capture, kidnap people, and enslave them. And some of the European nations began to go to war over the mm -hmm. uh, newly discovered land, you know, which is which was Africa. So in 1494, the uh, Pope had a treaty called the Treaty of Tordesillas, where he divided up Africa. So, you know, it was like, you get this, you get this. But then other European nations wanted to get involved. So a couple of years later, they had uh, what was known as the Berlin Conference. And that's when England, yeah, they, they speak different European languages based off of the Treaty of Tur Tordesillas in 1494 and the... Uh, Berlin conference that came shortly after that. So I just want to clear that up. Ain't no all, all that sixteen nineteen and the good ship Jesus landing in Jamestown, Virginia. Not nah, that's bullshit. <laughs> they were over here. Right. They were right, over right. here in, in, they were in, over in the here. damn fourteen nineties. They were over here in the fourteen nineties. And mm -hmm. we have historical yes. documents that, that we'll talk about it. You could you could right. Google the Treaty of Tordesillas, right? It's T O R D E S I L L A S, right? And it talks about how it divided up the uh new land between Spain and Portugal. And then it says right. off the coast of Cape Verde. That's Africa. So even in Google, yes, they, yes. they try right. to bullshit you, but the truth is there. It's a historical document. Right. Been, how do you discover... Yeah, yeah, for, for centuries, but how no, do you discover just... what people already lived there? How do you discover yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. It's already occupied. Well, that's, that's the... Yeah, that's propaganda. I just wanted to make sure everybody knew that mm -hmm. slavery started yeah, in the because, 1490s. Yes, yes, yeah. I was incorrect with that. You are correct. Yeah. Because the, the people that they, the reason they say they discovered it because one is a couple of things. One, they weren't Christian, so they considered them savages. Right. So therefore, they, they weren't human. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. ergo, they discovered it. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. All righty. All righty. We're pushing up against the clock, but I do want to say that uh, 
I like the responses to going back to Africa because I don't think that we would if if we were to go back to Africa, and it's been it's been tried. You know, Liberia is an example uh, mm-hmm. of you know sending slaves or uh, ex slaves back to Africa. You know, and you saw you saw what happened with Liberia. You know, they had such raw material that just messed Liberia up, just like they did other countries with on the continent. Okay, and that's the place where in the future. That's where most of your natural resources are. So it's going to be a mess over there, right? But I did want to kind of qualify that question about going back to Africa by saying that I was thinking of something along the lines of what the Jews did with Israel. In 1948, they found it in the state of Israel. They took Palestinian lands and they just took it. All right, that's what I was talking about, Mm -hmm. taking land on the continent and making a declaration and moving back that way. And I see that, mm-hmm. that we ruled that out anyway. Okay? That's that's not gonna happen. And I'm so happy that y'all guys think so that, that, that because that's that the way piece of know. land over there in the Middle East. No, right. Walter, that, that piece of land over in the Middle East that is now Israel, that land belonged to England, well, it didn't belong to England. England took it, but England gifted that to the Zionists. England mm-hmm. gifted that to the Zionists. And yeah. there are plenty of um, Jewish historians that will that will tell you. You could go on YouTube and find it. They will tell you that they believe that the Zionists were working in tandem with Hitler to get the Jews out of Germany to to help form what is now Israel. Because at the time it was just desert. It was just a wasteland, and the Zionists wanted mm-hmm. more Jews over there. Yeah, it's crazy, man. Like you, oof, ooh. the one thing about knowledge, once you get it, it makes you angry, and then you walk around depressed. Everybody you talk to, you yeah. feel like they're yeah. dumb as hell, you know. And you, you, it's like only, only person you got is God. So I think that becoming knowledgeable uh, brings you closer to God because sometimes that's the only person you could talk to. I'm glad mm-hmm. you said that because I'm telling you, doing research for this show, I get so depressed sometimes and I get angry. I get mad. Right. That's what, I think that's I think that's why we gotta focus on knowing history, period. Not just black history. We gotta know it all. You we you gotta study it all because you gotta know when they turn around and try to use history against you, you gotta know their history when they misquote it to you. So it's it's more mm-hmm. than black history. It's knowing history. We got to know world history. We got to know how yeah. it all happened. And you know, too. It's funny how you said that uh, history, finding out things can depress you because I'm my family's historian. And I did, uh, I went back to 1739 on my family history. And oh, during the family history, you know, awesome. I was able to retrieve slave records documented on um, uh, Ancestry.com, you know, and that goes back to where we were talking about filling out your census. That's where the information comes from. So when I got to the point where I saw some information about my great great grandfather being, you know, a slave, I got so depressed about it that I just stopped. I stopped right there. I didn't go any further. I didn't even go do my pilgrimage that I wanted to do because it just made me so angry that you know, to see where my, you know, my family's name came from, the slave master, and seeing him as a slave. It was, it was just depressing. You got to let that be your but, fuel, not your frustration. Right. And, and right. True. And um, I got, it took me a while to get over it, but I was glad that I did at least, you know, at least I know where I came from. Mm-hmm. So. It's sobering yeah. to, right, so- to, to listen and to realize what it is and it and it becomes very heavy and a lot of us can't necessarily carry it but we don't have to carry it by ourselves right and i think that sometimes right. we think that we're the only ones and mm-hmm. sometimes we can be embarrassed by it because we we had no idea mm-hmm. uh, we can be embarrassed by it because you know it happened in our family and we're like nah we came from here and this that and the third and you right. know and right. I, I think you know greg you know Put it, you know, plainly, you know, saying, you know, we and not not just to you, but to 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 
all of us and to oh, everyone that, that be listening, right. you know, I'll, don't right. let it frustrate. Let it be your fuel. You know what I'm saying? Let it fuel you to continue to do more. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and when I mean do more, it matters not how much you're doing. It doesn't matter if you if if like for me, I, I do I do teachings and classes and trainings all over the country. I can do more. I'm, I'm on I, I work in Capitol Hill now, but I can do more. Gene is is, is an elected official with them Bronx and he's out beating the streets, knocking on doors, kissing baby when well, I in COVID. But, you know, he, he's doing the political <laughs> thing, whatever. But do more. You know, the yeah, Walt Weasley show is on. And we have these. But do so. And so. You know, I think it's it's incumbent upon all of us yeah, to really yeah. figure out, you know, what are we currently doing and how can I do more? So great job on you, Michelle. That's good. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. All right. All right. OK, so we're pushing up against the clock. And as usual, we'll be going to uh, it was a great show, guys. Yes. Awesome. Fantastic. Uh, fantastic. You know, the as big four. I mean, I really. Uh, big four. I'm gonna turn it over. Before I turn it over, I do want to know, you know, from each panel member, what you know, we got a, a holiday three, you know, three day weekend coming up, and mm-hmm. you know, everybody be a little festive. Uh, any any parting words to our audience? Anything that you want to get across to them? I'll any take away I'll that you got from this conversation that you want to reiterate. I, or, yeah, I'll I'll start. Um. No, nah, that's you know, that's 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 big swing, you know, knocking <laughs> in the kitchen. Um yes, he's he doing his thing. Um no, so one Memorial Day um is a day of remembrance of those who have gone. A lot of time people get it confused with like with like a veterans day. And, you know, and granted, I, as a as a veteran, uh, myself and Greg and, uh, you know, we you know, we always are appreciative of the thank you know, the, the, the thanks. But, you know, this is for those who have, who have passed and who have gone on, either those who have 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 made the, the ultimate sacrifice in battle or have have since passed. Um, and so we want to make sure that we're we're even though we are in a celebratory mood, understanding that we're celebrating the lives of those who have given the ultimate sacrifice. Um, and so I, I want that to be kind of, I'm not, you know, I don't want nobody to be down about it, but I want that to be, you know, people to be remembered and be cognitive of, of what Memorial Day really is about. And then also the history, I think that, that Walter, I think that you had gave it, given to it before as into where it really started at, um, a lot, a lot of great things happened in this country started with us. Um, but anyways, I digress. Um, peace and blessings to everyone. Um, but Amen. next question. Yeah. Hey, uh, Ernest, uh, Ernest, you, spot on. Ernest, Ernest, spot on. Ernest, Ernest, you were spot on, Ernest. Because I really hate it when people say to me, thank you for your service for Memorial Day. I say, no, that's Veterans Day. This is the, this is the day where we honor all of the fallen, you know? Right. And y- you're correct. Right. I can't think of the regimen. Uh, Ernest, but it was started by a black regiment uh, Memorial Day. It was started yep. by black people and it was uh, co-opted yeah. by this country. Sorry for the sirens. Um, but um, Ernest, um, now that, you know, COVID yeah. has gotten you know, under control, every Memorial Day me and some of my boys that I served in the Navy with, we get together in D.C. Like, like, because I was stationed uh, out there in Arlington and at the Pentagon. So I got a lot of friends, you know, from D.C. and we get together. We didn't do it last year for obvious reasons, but I'm leaving tomorrow. I'll be down in D.C. by tomorrow late afternoon and we're going to have a big barbecue on Sunday. I, I believe we're going to be in the southeast area. I have to give you the address. Um, but, you know, if, if you and the uh, Mrs. are free, well, she's not the Mrs. yet. But if you and the almost misses are free, y'all come on by, man. Get some, get some good barbecue. Get you some, you know, good drinks and some good conversation. That's if you don't mind being around a bunch of sailor, 
Because I know you a jawhead and you guys get nervous around us. <laughs> oh, no, y'all, 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 look, y'all were my professional taxi driver when I went to when I went to Iraq. So I appreciate the ride and I appreciate the hospitality and the open oh, invitation. So man, y'all some great it. cooks. Y'all some real oh, good cooks. So I appreciate go. that. Thanks, Gene. I'm a, yeah. I'm a side, hey, I'm a side step. I'm a side step to argument right. from the from the two spinoff branches. Of the, of the military, you know, as opposed to the original military branch, you know, the army. But uh, I mean, they're both. I mean, you know, they're both absolutely right. You know, when it comes to it, this is about the fallen. This is about us giving, yes. giving, um, giving. You know, our our memorials to you know those that that died. We served, but they gave their lives. And I'm glad that Gene all we mentioned did. that. I'm glad Gene mentioned that we did start Memorial Day because I was right. going to say that. It, that's right. That's a, a big black thing. That's, that's, that, was started that always that. gets left out. And it was co-opted, of course, you know. And I, too, will be in the Maryland, D.C. area tomorrow. I'm catering the function there, 50th birthday party with a family and friend, all friends. So I just want everybody to be safe. Um, uh Earlier, we were talking about the weather. The weather is going to be a little crazy. Yesterday, I don't know what came through here. It was like a little mini hurricane or whatever. My my lawn furniture, my chairs, I had these heavy Anirondack chairs, and they were in the middle of the yard. So just be careful in your travels, guys. That's all I'm saying. Have a great right. weekend. Welcome all right. Guys. Thank you, guys. All right, Ms. Cheryl, I'm going to turn it over to you. Yes. And thank you, guys. Mm-hmm. Everyone was wonderful as always. Thank you. Hold, 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 hold on. Excuse me, Michelle. Welcome, was that big? Michelle, was that big swing? Say he's gonna be in D.C. this weekend. Yeah, man. Better get that phone. Yes, sir, I'm in. I'm in D.C. all the time. Well, then come through on. Come, well, come through on Sunday, bro. Will, you, you in will, earnest. Come through. Will, I will. I will touch. I, I will touch base with you when I get out there. All right. That's all a right, promise. big swing. Keep my word. All right. all right. You're keeping all the food to yourselves. That's all right. Oh, man. <laughs> I mean, you guys enjoy yourselves out there. Man. Y'all be safe. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Be yeah. Safe. This was a great, great show um, in closing. God bless George Floyd. And uh, we salute our fallen heroes. Thank you, Walter. Mark your calendars for our upcoming show. We are celebrating Juneteenth on June 16th at 6 p.m. with a live via Zoom. We will keep everyone posted on that. We hope everyone can join us on that. And also the Friday of Juneteenth weekend, we will be celebrating our 100th episode of the Walt Weekly. We're excited about that and hope and we will have a special guest appearing in just to give us a shout out. And we'll have a weekly um, panel, yes. 100th episode. It's a milestone. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, we got the props at the end. Awesome. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you to our sponsors, Beauty Blends by Ami Soap and Love and Michelle Sweeney here and our weekly panel members. We appreciate you guys. Our live audience, thank you for joining in for our Friday Live. You can follow us at thewaltweekly.com, IG and Facebook, The Walt Weekly, Twitter, Walt Weekly, Podbean, The Walt Weekly. We are on iTunes, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Pandora, and other streaming platforms. Please, everyone, have a safe and awesome Memorial Weekend. Be safe out there with your driving. Stay dry. And thank you all once again. Be safe. Wear your mask, even if you are vaccinated. Love you guys. Have a great one. Good night. Yes, have a great one. All the best. I'm happy. I'm getting. I'm getting happy now. You know. Yeah, you happy now. Audio, audio effects. Yeah. Audio effects. Thanks, All guys. Right. Okay. Stay thank you so much. Stay blessed, everybody. Right, bye, bye.